how we go about working with emergency managers, and then how we take that information we get from them, apply it to our, you know, our own practice to estimate life loss, and then after we've done that, how can we can <coughs> link back up with them to give them meaningful feedback about how they can take action to reduce risk. Um, some of you in here work for consultants and one thing that you have the ability to do that we don't really in the federal government is 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 really reach out and say hey we can we can help you out with something like this you know we can show you how to use life sim and, and learn about how it might help you do some evacuation planning or um, we can go through these different sort of flood scenarios or dam breach scenarios and help identify potential opportunities for improvement with your emergency action planning and, and that's a that's a that's something you you have the flexibility to do and that's that's important and powerful work all right um, how to provide feedback to emergency managers examples of how to use life sim results to help with evacuation and emergency response planning really quick overview since you've gone through all of this stuff already this week uh, so Warning evacuation timeline, hazard identified at a project, communicate that hazard to emergency managers. Once it gets to the emergency managers, they decide how to take that information they've been given and turn it into action related to communicating with the public, alerting the public. Warning diffusion, how long does it take to disseminate that first alert to the public? And once that warning is received by the public, how long does it take people, once they've received that notification, to take a protective action? So, gone through all that. Um, and, and why we care so much about this timeline, right, is because it's really important to try to figure out what that exposed PAR estimate might look like, right? And, and one of the hardest things we do, say the, the hardest thing with, with estimating life loss is estimating indirect life loss. If you try to find data to help inform how you do that, it's, it's a real challenge. Before I got into trying to figure out how to estimate indirect life loss, I'd say, this is probably the hardest part of estimating life loss. All right, so this, this front part, something we're working on right now is, is um, the effects of emergency action plans owner-operator emergency action plans on downstream consequences, which is kind of interesting. This week we've talked a lot about working with EMAs, and that's kind of this part of the timeline here, you know, warning issuance delay, warning diffusion, mobilization time, that's, that's owned by the emergency management community, right? But how we monitor, respond to, and identify threats at our infrastructure, its use case infrastructure, and communicate that to emergency managers. That's that's something you know, dam owners, dam owners own in this timeline. So that's that's another thing we've got going on right now that we're working on. All right, you've seen this risk-informed framework to infrastructure hazard performance consequences. We live over here, right? All right. Life loss essential elements. Gone through this this week already again. Um, initial distribution of population, then we redistribute that group. How many people are exposed to flooding? So we have that initial distribution and that redistribution through evacuation. That's really what we're gonna focus on here. Then got these other factors, severity of flooding, stability, will people die based on where they're exposed and then potential for indirect life loss. So. We've, we've touched on a lot of this stuff. Right now we're gonna focus on this and, and how we can work with emergency managers maybe to improve what that redistribution looks like. All right, engaging with emergency management. Uh, risk management involves consequences management, right? There's, there's really two ways to reduce, to reduce risk. Um, one, you can change how, how likely an area is to get wet, right? Whether it's building a levee or widening a channel, whatever it might be, you can do something to reduce the likelihood that water gets to a certain area. 
So that's one side of it. The other side of it is you can take action that reduces the consequences of water getting to that area, right? So th those are really the two primary things we can do. There's several things under each umbrella, but two primary things we can do to reduce risk um, from flooding. The effective consequence management, you need to understand the key factors that drive life loss. We've talked a lot about those factors this week. And to understand those factors, that really requires that you engage with emergency managers. Now, there's certainly factors like a good hydraulic model, understanding those flood characteristics, the severity of the flood. And then there's those factors that involve uh, the warning and evacuation process and how people are likely to behave and trying to elicit those protective actions, right? And then from there, we can identify risk reduction measures. So Jason talked to you about when he went through the Warning PAI presentation yesterday, you know, best things we got out of that research from Dr. Smiletti and Sorensen was this guide to public alerts and warnings for dam and levee emergencies. How we take and use that information to interact with emergency managers is we go through this interview schedule. It's 52 questions long, and some of those questions have several sub-questions associated with them. These elicitations normally take on the order of a half day. And what we try to do is get everyone together in a room and don't just include, you know, the primary emergency manager, you know, could be the director of the Office of Emergency Services for a county, but include, you know, emergency responders from the different municipalities in that county uh, and other folks that would play a role in issuing a warning and responding to that message. So there's a lot of value in just having all those people in the room and having that conversation, right? Because once you start going through these questions and they start answering them, it's pretty illuminating. Sometimes one person will say something and another person will say something similar, it might be a little different. And then you've got this side conversation that otherwise might not have happened, but it's actually quite valuable for those two folks to be on the same page. So going through that interview question, schedule is one of, one of the most important things we do in, in the world of estimating life loss consequences because it gives us an opportunity to engage with emergency managers and really get a much better understanding of what evacuation potential might look like in that particular area downstream of one of our dams or within one of our levees. Then we take the information we get from that and a lot of these questions are, are yes, no, right? They're, we, it's a binary response either. Yeah, we have it or yeah, we don't. Um, but the interesting thing about the interview schedule is it really plays off of itself. And some of the questions are redundant and you might ask, you know, question 32 and they say something that contradicts the answer they gave for question eight. And then at the end of the day, after you've gone through the elicitation, you know, if, if you set it up right, you have several people taking notes, you all get together afterwards and you go through and all get on the same page about the answers. And it could be that you find these contradictions. So there's, there is some interpretation involved. And it's a relatively small group of us in the core that have done have gone through this process, facilitated one of these elicitations. Um, we'd really like to increase how big that group is, but opportunity, you know, how often we hold those elicitations and then making sure you have someone that someone else might be able to learn from available to do that is, is a challenge. Um, it's always a challenge to build the bench, but something we try to think of. But how we take those answers, interpret them, and then we get them into this scoring sheet. And this is really where it starts to help us. We take, we, we get those responses into a scoring sheet based on how we interpreted their responses. And those, the, those we call it a scoring sheet. It's not, no one's being judged or scored. It's just how we, based on the research Millennium and Sorensen did, we can come up with relationships for warning issuance delay, warning diffusion, and protective action initiation, right? And we can take those and get that into our life sim model. That's really going to reduce our uncertainty about that redistribution of population at risk. So then, once we've done all that, 
We go and build our life sim model, we run our life sim model, we simulate evacuation, come up with these life loss estimates, go through the risk assessment process, all that good consequences work, helps support that risk assessment, gives us a better idea of what, or, or, or a more true representation of what risk is for that particular project, dam or levy. Um, and then, when that's all done, we've, we've been able to engage with the emergency managers. We've got something from them. They've, they've helped out. They've had the opportunity to engage with people in the core, maybe um, dam, you know, operations manager at a dam that maybe they don't get an opportunity to talk to a whole lot. So that's, that's a good thing. So there's value added from them in, in going through the elicitation process. But on the back end, it's super important that we link back up with them show them how we interpreted the information they gave us and how we went about using that information. And then if we can provide them some, some beneficial feedback that might help them improve their emergency response procedures and think about how they might adjust those procedures, including evacuation planning and do a better job in the future. So, we start by provide. We definitely provide them. If we go through the elicitation process, we're sure to give them this guide. Right? Say, hey, all the research that's behind this interview schedule, it's available here. It'll talk you through. It's it's only 33, 34 pages. Um, it's colorful. It's intuitive. It's easy to follow. It's a it's a really good resource for the emergency management community. So when we go through the elicitation process. We provide we provide that. Then, link back up in these after action meetings. I think we've had, we haven't had a lot of them. I'm, I'm aware of two. We've got a third coming up. So it's not something that's been done a lot. It's something we're trying to do a lot more of. Um, we have to do a good job of making the case to fund that effort on the back one because we've already gotten through the risk assessment process, right? So let's link back up with the emergency management community. Start by taking them through that timeline, you know, reminding them, hey, this is this is what brought us here in the first place. This is what we were trying to understand. Then, you know, we we target those primary factors, warning issuance delay, um, warning diffusion, protective action initiation. And then we draw links between the answers that they gave and really how we interpreted those answers. Um, it's, it's important to be, you, you know, it's important to think about how you communicate to, to anybody um, and saying, you know, based on what you said, this is how you can do better. We'd like to soften that a little bit and say, based on how we interpreted the responses you gave to the questionnaire, these are some potential opportunities for improvement. So talk a little bit about the primary factors based on what you told us and how we interpreted it. One thing that could really help shorten that warning issuance delay is having a threat matrix that defines actions associated with different threat levels, right? It's, it's something that I would say of, of the elicitations I've gone through, maybe eight to 10 at this point, there's this is something that's fairly common that's missing so getting that threat matrix in there is important because it defines the actions you need to take at specific flood levels or threats threat levels and all right we're here these are the things we need to do rather than saying all right we're here what does everyone think we should do about it you can see how that would extend that time period so that helps shorten that warning issuance delay um, rules and procedures are in place for dam and levy operator and emergency manager communication. If a dam owner and a downstream emergency manager don't communicate at all, that's a problem, right? It, it might be a challenge to find their information, a downstream emergency manager's information. You might not have that person's information. Um, so that can extend that hazard communication delay. And then if you haven't communicated with someone and someone calls you up out of the blue and tells you, hey, I'm so-and-so, you need to evacuate your town, you might say, sorry, who's this? 
you know, so the presence of that communication, communicating with each other regularly, participating in tabletops together, and, and having that relationship ahead of an emergency is, is important for reducing that warning issuance delay. So this is, this is an example of feedback that um, Jason and I actually gave to uh, some emergency managers downstream of a dam in Texas. And this is kind of how we did it. We took them through, you know, remind, talked to them a little bit about the science, got in a little into it a little more than they would have during the elicitation to help develop the feedback a little bit. Then we, one of them was, you know, uh, one of the emergency managers was really engaged, asked a lot of good questions ahead of time, um, email communication, and we just asked him if it would be all right if we used the feedback we had for him as an example. He was open to that. Um, we do provide everyone with handouts that walks through stuff like this. So that's part of that after action meeting as well. Then some of the secondary factors, number of people involved in making a warning decision has been minimized. So the doctors found um, is that about the, the, the optimal number is three or less. If you have more than three, you might have too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak and that can extend that warning issuance delay time. Maybe it's four people who are like-minded and you can get to that conclusion really quickly, but generally three is, is the right number. That gives you enough to sanity check one another, um, but not so many that it's gonna slow down making a decision about how to, about issuing a warning, right? Um, and then actually go to the questions and how we interpreted the questions and show them, you know, this is the answer you gave, or this is how we interpreted it, and that's how we brought it back and linked it to that feedback we just gave you. So we, we make sure to link it back to the interview schedule because we, we all went through that together. Um, now I'm skipping ahead to protective action initiation. So again, you know, we'd go through the primary factors. I didn't include that slide here because it's a little redundant, but. And we'd say, okay, these are the primary factors that impacted, you know, what those relationships looked like based on the feedback you gave us. This one happened to be environmental cues, which would be, you know, if there's a wildfire tumbling towards you, you see the smoke, you, you know, there's, there's the environmental cues really, really kind of slap you in the face. With a dam, you know, Orville's not a bad example. It was... Beautiful sunny day in Northern California, the day that Orville, um, that emergency spillway started to unravel. So if it's nice and sunny out and you tell someone that a flood's coming, you can imagine, I'm not sure that makes sense. So it's important in your messaging to talk about what's going on outside. So describing the environment, how they should interpret the environment and that doesn't just mean hey it's nice out and there's a flood coming it could also mean you know rapidly rising water velocities are increasing things like that to help make it make sense for people um, for this particular example i skipped warning diffusion um, this this county got the highest score you possibly could for warning diffusion so we didn't have feedback i just showed a slide with a thumbs up icon um, they had several communication channels. Um, they actively tested them. They actively drilled with them. They used them regularly to reach population that, or population in their county for different reasons on a weekly basis. Uh, so they had they had several ways to to issue first alerts to people for a dam emergency. So there really wasn't a whole lot of feedback we could provide there. And then again, just linking it back to the questions. In this case, it's message content, and they they missed a couple of things, um, particularly this environmental cues one. All right. So that's hey, we went through the interview schedule. We used that that feedback from you to come up with these relationships. Based on your feedback, we you know, and how we use that. There's there's an opportunity, you know, and how these different factors are weighted. You know, you, there's a fairly good opportunity for making improvements 
that could really shorten the amount of time it takes to get a warning to the public and the content of that warning, the content of that message is going to play a role in, in helping elicit the right sort of protective action response. So we provide that feedback, but we also built this life sim model, right? And when you do detailed hydraulic modeling, detailed life sim modeling for infrastructure failure, it's, it's pretty important, I think, to get it into the hands of people who can use it. You know, we go through it, use it to estimate risk, rack and stack our portfolio, and figure out where we need to spend money to reduce risk. But then it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for these things to go sit on the shelf until the next time we need them when we've got this updated inundation modeling that could really help emergency managers understand what their flood risk looks like from an upstream breach, also help them define geofence, the people that need to receive a message, and so on. So when we have these meetings and engage with emergency managers, we also want to take them through the LifeSim model, what we've learned from the LifeSim model, and show them how they could use LifeSim to help further improve their emergency response procedures, right? So I'm going to quickly go through that. So provide inundation maps, like I just said. Um, now this is just a color wheel for that particular depth grid. I might suggest, I made this map, so I'm critiquing myself right now. Um, I might suggest, you know, using depth ranges to, and, and coloring those a little differently to help those EMAs understand, you know, where you, you might want to think about evacuating people earlier. You know, the important thing is, first and foremost, they have the extent. Understanding where which areas are at higher risk is, is helpful. And that's that's the next component, which is why, you know, depth ranges might be helpful. Um, changes to expose PAR. I think you can use the license and say, hey, based on the feedback we got from you, our median estimate for exposed PAR for this particular event about 150,000. If, if I change everything and you have the best relationships possible, you, you incorporate these changes that we're suggesting, there's a chance that you could reduce the number of people exposed by you know, something greater than, than 100,000. That's significant. That, that means something to an emergency manager. Um, I wouldn't say that by any means I'm a risk communication effort, but when we do this stuff as much as we can, we try to take this information and, and package it in a way that it's, you know, makes light bulb go off. I'm like, oh yeah, that, that means something to me. 100,000 fewer people are going to be exposed to the flood. Yes, that's, that's the type of information I want. Tell me how to do that. Um, and this is just, all I did here in LifeSim is just took a, uh, I, I made a heat map with, for this particular event, for exposed PAR at, during the day for, for this particular event. So it, it's, you can mess around with, you know, what, what the, what the density looks like and, you know, this one's, this one's kind of blurry. I could, I could pare down the radius and, and make it look a little different, but you can see where those concentrations are. And then if you go further, you could delineate it, you know, by county, depending on, you know, who the emergency manager is that you're talking with, so on and so forth. Um, identify areas that may require an early warning. Uh, describe what drives the need for an early warning. In this case, um, this is just arrival time of two feet of flooding at structures downstream. So you see these in the dark orange, that structures where flood depths of greater than two feet arrive at those structures inside of two hours. So that's a short amount of time, right? And that's, that's relative to the time of breach, not relative to the, to the warning time, okay? So if you had a warning that went out four hours before that, um, that would give people, you know, as much as five hours in those orange structures because it's one to two hours, as much as five hours to take a protective action before two feet of flooding was on their structure. 
we use two feet of flooding as kind of a surrogate for a non-evacuation depth. If you've got that much water outside your home, it's less likely that you go outside, try to get in your car and drive away, right? So uh, arrival time at structures, that, that can be a helpful tool. That's something you could get from LifeSim. Um, I'm gonna call out this particular area. You can see there's really this major egress route down here and then this one right here, which takes you to a major, uh, another major thoroughfare. And then there's this reservoir right here. Now how, you can see in the model that's releasing just a little bit by the looks. Um, they didn't even include it in the hydraulic model, so I'm not sure exactly how. That might just be a, it might just have a boundary condition to find right there and have a little bit of water coming in. But for this particular event, this northern egress route gets wet pretty early and then that access to that southern route is only available on this this smaller road here or out this secondary road right here so you're flanked by this reservoir this major egress route and there's it becomes unavailable so you've got pretty limited routes of egress for a, a neighborhood, pretty large community, I guess, um, probably 10 to 20,000 people right here, and you've got only a couple available egress routes. So looking at that and seeing how quickly water arrives, I would say, hey, based on this, this is a good area to consider warning early, right? Make sure that they get a message um, well ahead of time. So maybe you don't wait for breach. Maybe when you're thinking about your threat matrix, you're looking at this neighborhood and saying, all right, water's got up to a certain point. Because water's up so high, we're gonna, we're gonna warn you early. Also, maybe you need to close this road because we see that that crossing right there, that bridge crossing gets overwashed. Um, this is the same sort of thing using road segments, all right? So arrival time with two feet of flooding on these road segments. When you build a road network in an area like this, it's an absolute web and you can, spend, um, you can spend a lot of time wanting to edit it. What I would say is that what, what modeling is iterative and when you run a model like LifeSim and you go back in and look at these results, you run animations, you can spend, a, spend some time looking to see things, you know, looking for things that jump out of you. A lot of cars getting stuck when they evacuate in an area that maybe doesn't look like they should. And when you see stuff like that, that's how you go through and, and make changes to your road network. You, you don't want to spend, it, this shouldn't become overly tedious. You should be able to make incremental changes to your road network when you're simulating evacuation that remove any obvious problems and feel fairly confident about your road network moving forward. Now, if you're using it to help with evacuation planning, you might choose to spend a little more time um, synthesizing that road network and getting getting a lot of those attributes right. But if you've got a if you've got a high resolution terrain model and a fairly good road network data even if it's from OpenStreetMaps, which is, is what we tend to use, most likely you've got a, you've got a, a fairly good representation of, of the road system and you can simulate evacuation. All right, so going back to that same neighborhood, see one thing you can get from LifeSim is, is life loss on roads and darker the color, um, the higher the life loss estimate. So when you see a lot of life loss right before a crossing like this, it means that either you didn't add a vertical offset and it's not recognized that there's a bridge there. Lifeson doesn't know there's a bridge there. Or that bridge gets overwashed, right? In this case, that bridge got overwashed and cars stacked up here. So choke point, possible closure location. And if you run this simulation, you can see how the flood propagates overwashes the bridge and people trying to evacuate that way in the model get stuck and then there's nowhere to go 
and that's why this area is a good candidate for an early warning, right? Identifying risk reduction measures. So I talked earlier about there's, there's kind of two ways. One, we can do something to limit the likelihood that all these folks over here get flooded, or we can do something to mitigate the impacts or consequences of that flooding. And here's, here's some things, you know, elevating structures, relocation, buyout, flood proofing, elevating and flood proofing are non-structural measures that often get considered in core planning studies. Improving the flood warning system or the emergency preparedness plan. That's, that's really what we're doing here when we're working with emergency managers, right? Um, and then communication for awareness plans and drills. We've talked a little bit about those this week.